Well, I don't know about you, but I uh, really like uh, getting a good book recommendation. And uh, last year, Jessica Holmberg uh, recommended uh, a good book uh, to me that I've put on my list uh, to read uh, soon. It's called Watching the English. I don't know if anyone else has uh, read that here or come across it. It's by a lady called Kate Fox, and in it she unearths the, uh, the quirks and habits of English culture. Here's a couple of examples. On tea, she says this. Tea is still believed by English people of all classes to have miraculous properties. A cup of tea can cure or at least significantly alleviate almost all minor physical ailments from a headache to a scraped knee. Tea is also an essential remedy for all social and psychological ills, from a bruised ego to the trauma of a divorce or bereavement. Whatever your mental or physical state, what you need is a nice cup of tea. Another quirk uh, she highlights is English understatement. English understatement, she says, means uh, that a painful illness is just a bit of a nuisance. An outstanding performance or achievement is not bad. An unforgivably stupid misjudgment is not very clever. Uh, the Antarctic is rather cold and the Sahara is a bit too hot for my taste. We're a strange bunch, aren't we? And culture is a strange thing to understand uh, because it's full of ideas and, and customs and social behaviours that are built up over quite a long period of time. And this week, having uh, been introduced to the idea of missional communities two weeks ago uh, by uh, Nick Harding, and then gone on to look at the nuts and bolts of what that looks like with some great uh, testimonies from those who've been involved in trying it out over the last few months, uh, we're going to think this morning about the culture that is at the heart of those communities that we're seeking uh, to create. So a reminder, missional communities are groups of 18 to 30 people who get together three to four times a month with a shared aim of reaching a particular neighbourhood, network or, or, or area of need with the good news of Jesus. And the culture that they seek to generate and that we're seeking to generate as a church can be summed up in three words. Family on mission. Family on mission. And this morning we're going to explore what that means, why it's effective and who it involves what it means, why it's effective, and who it involves. But before we do that, let's, let's stop to pray and invite God to open our hearts and our minds and ears to what he has to say to us this morning. Father, thank you that you're already here in this place by your spirit, inhabiting our worship and our praise. And we pray that as we come now to think about what this passage from Ephesians has to say to us today at St. Andrew's, in the time and the context we find ourselves in. Pray that you would just open us up to hear what it is you have to say to us as a church, but also as individuals. Lord, that you would encourage us with what is possible uh, through your spirit, uh, for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start off with uh, what being a family on mission means. Uh, when you hear that, you may think of something like The Incredibles uh, or maybe uh, The Famous Five. Uh, but Paul's not talking about that kind of family in Ephesians 4. Now, his idea of family isn't primarily biological. In verse 6, he says, there is one God and Father of all. And it sounds like he's talking about God as creator, doesn't it? One God and Father of all humanity. But I don't think that's quite it. If we dig a bit deeper, we see that in the original letter to the Ephesians, there's a word in there that's missing from our English translations, and that's the word you. Paul actually wrote, there is one God and Father of you all. You being the church in Ephesus to, who, to which he was writing. He's saying you, church, are a family. Because it's by faith in Christ that you all share the same heavenly Father. And most of us are probably used to talking about the church family, aren't we? But what do we really mean when we say that? What is that supposed to look like? Well, you may or might not be aware that 
Uh, human civilization has been going for 6,000 years now, and yet it's only in the last 600 of those years that we've uh, organized ourselves in what are called nuclear families. Mum, dad, 2.4 kids, that kind of thing. Yeah, for most of human history, people have been organized in what's called uh, extended families, in which people beyond the immediate family members share life together. People alongside uh, mum and dad influences the kids' uh, development. It's where resources like possessions, money, and time uh, are shared. And uh, so family life happens in community. And that's been the case for most of human history, but also in other cultures, uh, it's still the case around the world today. The extended family is where people find uh, their identity. And because that was the norm when Paul wrote, I'm pretty sure that's what he wanted church to look like too when he talked about church being family. And in fact, it's what it did look like in the early church. The Romans called these extended families uh, households. Households. And they included biological family, friends, neighbours, relatives, co-workers, including uh, at that time slaves who were in the house, uh, and people with whom uh, they did business, are all connected via the head of the house. It's hard to find anything comparable uh, to that in our culture today. But one uh, thing that slightly compares in our culture, I suppose, the closest I can come, is, is the TV sitcom Friends. I don't know uh, if anyone's a Friends fan here. I certainly am. There was a reunion uh, of the Friends cast uh, a couple of years back. And, and at that, Marta Kaufman, uh, one of the writers of Friends, summed up the premise of the show like this. She said, Friends is about a time in your life when your friends are your family. And by the time uh, the show's a few series in, that's exactly what the characters are. They're an extended family. Some of them are married, some aren't. There are children in the mix. Uh, Phoebe's brother, his wife, and their triplets are recurring characters. Uh, Rachel's sisters, Gunther and Janice, and her husband. The list goes on. Friends deliberately didn't try to repair the nuclear family. Instead, it created an extended family, the likes of which young people were longing for then, and I believe still longing for today. In fact, a BBC article described it, the show, as the show that changed the idea of family forever. And we know that when churches uh, were formed, the first churches, they became like new households of 20 to 40 people or so, worshipping in a house. And missional communities are, like Simon said last week, a vehicle uh, that exists today to try to uh, recreate that culture, to get us to that destination uh, as a church. But these extended Christian families were also united around something other than their own interests. They were united around a calling, uh, uniquely to fulfill Jesus' great commission in their context. To go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or as Paul puts it in our reading, they sought uh, to live together a life worthy of the calling that they'd received. And I say this uh, call to, as I say, this call to a missional disciple, to be missional disciples, looks different in each context. And it looked different in each context then. So in the letters of the Philippians, in chapter 4, Paul writes, uh, and he says, All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. So there was a church, a family of God, meeting in the imperial palace at the heart of at the Roman Empire. And their shared aim must have been at reaching the rest of Caesar's palace for Christ. And that would obviously have been different to the way that, say, Lydia's church in Thyatira uh, saw their, um, their sort of call to live out the Great Commission in their context and in other churches around the Roman world. And yet the point is, in each group of those 20 to 40 uh, people, they they had the same culture of a genuine extended family, sharing resources, doing life together, meeting regularly, investing in one another's kids, all while on a mission to reach their context for Jesus. 
They were hardwired with a culture of real, meaningful family on a real and specific mission. A modern example of the same thing is a, a missional community that felt uh, called to reach a, a local school, and particularly the football team uh, that uh, ran out of that school and their players. 85% of the players don't have a dad, and so uh, to bring the family of God experience to this team, some of the guys in their 40s went along to uh, pra practices and matches to cheer uh, the team on. Some of the 20-somethings worked on the ground. Some of the ladies had the kids over when they needed a place to study or get a meal. Other couples helped them to apply to university, and some people raised money for them. And bit by bit, they shared the good news uh, with this team, not as individuals, but as a family on mission, inviting those players into their newly formed household. Another example is uh, the Cancer Warriors missional community. It's a group of 20 or so Christians whose particular calling is to serve patients and uh, families, uh, sorry, cancer patients and their families. They meet regularly to invest in building that culture of being a family on mission uh, with one another. They also serve that network of people together. Some drive patients to their appointments. Some are talented hairstylists who uh, help patients with their wigs. One is a photographer who captures families' uh, stories. And they all pray for healing. So why did these kinds of communities play such a big part in the growth of the early church? If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you'll have heard Nick Harding talk about that kind of growth graph and uh, how quickly the church grew over those first 300 years. Why did they play such a big part and why are they playing a role today? In John uh, 13, uh, verse 35, Jesus says, By this, everyone that will know that you are my, my disciples, if you have love for one another, or by the way, that you love one another. If people are often drawn to Jesus, aren't they, by seeing the love within a Christian uh, community. It's why on the one hand, in our reading this morning, Paul uh, describes uh, the church and declares plainly in verse 4 that there is only one body. Despite our denominations, there is one undivided church. And yet at the same time, he urges us to make every effort to stay united by bearing with one another in love. Because our love for one another that flows out of our love for God and, and his love for us is meant to be a bit like uh, when you go into a cafe or a chocolate shop and they offer you those tasters, don't they, to try a bit of what is on offer in the store uh, in order to try and kind of hook you on actually going and purchasing the real deal. People are meant to taste uh, when they come to us, taste a culture that's so different to the culture that's out there in the world around us and be captivated by it. You might have heard the story of uh, two uh, young gap year students who were backpacking through India. Uh, they came to a, a village in the jungle and were told that the next stretch of road uh, was in the territory of a tiger who'd taken to man-eating. They were understandably nervous, and as they set off the next morning, they were hoping uh, to hitch a lift. But as they kept trudging down the road, no lift came. And as darkness began to fall, and they could just begin uh, to see the light of the nearest village glowing in the distance, they heard a blood-curdling roar from the jungle beside them. And both of them started to run uh, to those lights in the distance as, far as, as fast as they could, until one of them stopped and... and, uh, and uh, reached into his backpack and pulled out a pair of running shoes to put them on. And the friend beside him said, what are you doing? You can't outrun a man-eating tiger. And he said, no, I don't have to. I only have to outrun you. <laughs> and that's, that's the culture so often, sadly, uh, that exists around us in the world, isn't it? A cult constant uh, culture of competition and comparison. But we're meant to be different. We're called to bear with one another in love. But where are people going to see us doing that? Where are people going to see us living that out in our relationships day by day, week by week with one another? I'm going to argue that it's probably not in a Sunday service. It's great to be here, gathered together uh, to worship one another. But just by the way we're sitting, 
we can tell we're, our focus is mostly on what's going on up here. We do relate with one another, of course, over tea and coffee, but that's a small part of our time together. How about in a small group? Well, small groups are great for um, getting to know people a bit deeper, um, perhaps starting to do that bearing with one another in love. But it's quite hard to invite a non-Christian friend or colleague or something like that along to our small group where we're uh, studying the Bible together, isn't it? That's a big ask. But if I bring my friend along to a barbecue or a picnic that my missional community is putting on, maybe for 30 or so people, then that's both easier to be uh, a part of, to invite them into, but it's also a place uh, where they can see our unity and love for one another on display. But being a family on mission also makes sense because it's God's original idea. After he started, uh, after he created uh, the world, he started with a family, Adam and Eve, and he gave them a mission, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And several centuries later, when they and their descendants had royally mucked things up, he chose another family headed by Noah, and he gave them the same mission. After Noah, virtually the next story in the Bible is about a family who God gives a mission to, the family of Abraham, who he says must go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. That's their mission. That family grew into a nation, essentially a tribe of families. And after decades of slavery, God liberated them, and you guessed it, gave them a mission. To be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation and a light for the Gentiles, that God's salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And from within that nation, God raised up his son, who pulled together a band of 70 or so followers, whom he consciously referred to as his family. And then he gave them the Great Commission. Because this is not just what God is like, this is who God is. In a sense, Paul describes God in Ephesians 4 as one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. And so in a sense, God himself is family. He exists in eternity, in relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, on mission to save the world. This week, I was reading about how the actors in the hit Netflix uh, show The Crown got so good at imitating uh, the real-life uh, members of the royal family. And what they did is they just watched hours and hours and hours and hours of footage of the real-life royal family, and then, until the point where they could mimic them, they could sound like them, they could do their mannerisms almost without thinking about it. And uh, as we seek to be more like God, we could do worse uh, than to look at how he's been working out his salvation plan for centuries now. By becoming, and then copy it by becoming extended families on mission. So finally, who is this for? Well, first, this is for you, however busy you may feel you are. Uh, because being a family on mission isn't about squeezing another thing into our already uh, full diary. It's about recycling the time that we already spend. This is a culture shift, not a, a series of programs that we're seeking to get you to cram into your life. The set structured times of missional communities fit into the existing midweek slot in which you might already be part of a small group. But the rest of it is about looking at what you're already doing, where you're already spending your time, and then finding others in the church who are doing those things too or spending their time in a similar way and seeing if you can join together with them and reach the sorts of people who you come across in those places or at those times. Because being a missionary disciple is all about being intentional in following Jesus wherever he's placed you. At work, at school, in our neighbourhoods, at the store, in the gym. It's about doing what we were doing anyway, but with spiritual glasses on. 
you'd be amazed what you can uh, make from recycling. Uh, just last year, it was announced that Citroen had made a whole car out of recycled uh, materials. Just imagine what we could do if we recycled our time for God. What we could build uh, for the kingdom. But lastly, this is for you, whatever your gifts are. Because as we were talking about uh, at the beginning, as uh, Simon was illustrating as we we're having fun together, Paul is clear in verse 13 that the body of Christ only grows when all God's people are involved in works of service. He literally says works of ministry. All God's people are doing ministry together. And that's part of developing this culture of family on mission. Because when families get together or uh, live together, jobs are shared out, aren't they? Everyone is involved in doing a chore or two. Everyone is involved in helping the family to thrive. Sadly, churches are too often more like a football match. 22,000 spectators desperately in need of exercise, watching 22 players desperately in need of a rest. That's not the culture of family on mission. Family on mission means we're all involved. The leadership team of a missional community, perhaps uh, three to five or six people, will have a balance of gifts, most likely. The gifts that Paul lists here, apostles, you might call them pioneers, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But their job is always, as Paul puts it, to equip his people, everyone else, for works of service. And that's our job as a staff team here at St. Andrews as well, to equip all of you for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. As Paul says here, each, to each one of us, uh, charis is the word he uses, grace. Which, that word charis is short for charismata, which means uh, spiritual gifts. So to each one of us, spiritual gifts have been given because when Jesus, Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts to his people. And being family on mission means using those gifts in the context of uh, the community we're a part of to build up the church. What does that look like? Well, I'm going to invite uh, Mick and I'm going to invite Jonathan uh, to the front just to share a bit of a story uh, about what that's looked like as we've been trying out this idea of being family on mission together as part of a pilot missional community. So if you want to grab the mic first. Mick. Um, so Mick, what sorts of things have you been involved in as we've been planning this, kind of doing this missional community pilot together? Yeah, I mean, obviously, is the, the stuff that we do on the day, and uh, we go into smaller groups, we look at um, a piece of scripture together. Um, it's been good to be able to share what I think God's been saying to me as we, we've shared amongst each other uh, through um, the passage. Uh, we've also been focusing on um, reaching out to other people in our everyday, uh, how we can tell our story uh, boldly to, to people. That's, that's been good. And I guess the other thing um, about using different gifts is we've had an activity, an outreach event each month. Um, so one of those events was on, on um, uh, for, for bonfire night. Again, we were just focusing on people who perhaps couldn't go to, um, to, to, to big shows around. So we put on an event uh, just in St. Andrew's uh, Garden here. Um, <clears throat> so Jimmy and I organized it. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group, which is uh, fantastic. So we just say, look, these are the things that we need. And people just brought what they wanted. Um, and I sort of uh, did most of the catering on the day, but I felt that that was also just releasing other people to be part of the other activities uh, that we did. And I think the important thing is that sort of half the people that were there were people who'd been invited in and were part of, of the mission community. So there's that great opportunity to have that fun evening around sort of a, a fire sparklers, uh, lots of food, just to uh, welcome people and to um, have conversations uh, with them. So, you know, everybody uh, pitched in and uh, so it was a really successful um, event. Great. And then we had a, an event, didn't we, for Christmas, a Christmas party that we invited some of the same people to yeah. and some new people. And you invited uh, a family to that, didn't you? Yes. Can you tell us a bit about how that happened? And what yeah, that like? so I was introduced to um, this Muslim friend, uh, family uh, by a friend from um, another church. 
And it was really good just to have a conversation uh, with them. They live quite close to um, the, the church. Um, and I felt that they were kind of very open to uh, what was going on uh, in the church. Part of that was because their daughters were attending um, the play group um, uh, at the church, which isn't part of the church, but is bringing them into uh, the church. Um, and um, I felt that, uh, you know, because they were very open to, to being in the church, they were, were potentially, as we were, we've been talking about, people of peace, people who... Um, people who were open to the gospel and people who were sympathetic uh, to, to um, uh, being shared about um, the gospel. And I think it's important that when you think about um, your, your gifts and uh, different types of uh, disciples, um, that I was very conscious that what I said is, well, look, we've got an event. Uh, it's about Christmas. I know you're Muslim, so it's just kind of uh, going to be a Christmas party. Um, all the people who are uh, organising the party are part of a, um, a wider group of Christians that I meet on a weekly basis. So I was very clear about the organisation, but also saying that, you know, it was largely going to be a time that they could come and have fun together um, as a, a family and encouraging them just to come to, to the event. And on reflection, I kind of was thinking about the way in which you, you talk to people and in different ways. And that when you think about the disciples of Jesus, you think about perhaps Andrew. And Andrew, um, for example, he was a, initially a disciple of John the Baptist and he heard Jesus. And so he went to his, uh, his brother Simon and simply said, I think I found the Messiah. You come along and, and find out about him. So he didn't sort of lay on and hours and hours of trying to convert him, but he just made that invitation and was just to kind of say his story very briefly, I found the Messiah. Yeah. And that actually, you know, being a disciple is just about being more intentional. And that's one of the things that I found out through the missional community. It's just in the everyday thinking about those opportunities to say something about what Jesus means to you. And these opportunities to invite people to particular um, events. Mm. Okay, so you were involved in some of the organising and then you invited this family along. And then at the event, Jonathan, you met them, didn't you? What happened next? I did. Um, so I met this, this, uh, this young couple with two young daughters. And we very quickly just got into spiritual conversations. So he had a lot of practical questions about what we do here. What is this church about? How often do you mean? And things like that. And I wasn't really interested in talking about those kind of details. I was interested in, in planting seeds of truth in his heart. And as I began doing that, and we were basically in the room out there, it was the night of the World Cup final. So it was a lot of excitement. We had the big screen and kids were watching the game and adults were watching the game. And I was watching the game with the boys. And then every once in a while, I would go over and just chat with him. I think we had two or three different moments during the evening where I had opportunity to just engage with him. And I found that this man, devout Muslim, was so spiritually hungry. And I, you know, I've been meeting Muslims for many years, and it's not often that you meet Muslims who are really open to have conversations about truth. Mm. And so I was just depositing things into his heart through mm. simple statements, simple things, just testing. And he was just hungering for more. <laughs> so by the end of the evening, I just felt the Holy Spirit, and that's why I think it's really important that we learn, and we've been talking about this in missional community, learn to hear the voice of the Spirit. I have a friend of mine, who she would describe it as listening in stereo. You listen to the person you're talking to, and you're also listening to God. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that evening, he's ready. He's ready to receive scripture and to start reading it. And at first I was like, do you want it in Urdu? Do you want it in this language? He's like, no, I was born and bred here. You know, I speak English. I, I'd rather have it in English. So I think I asked you, somebody, yeah. can I, you get a Bible? So I went over here and picked up one of those Bibles and just gave it to him. And he, his eyes opened up and he was like, wow, is this really, is this really the book that you read? I'm like, yeah, and why don't you start here? And maybe you might be interested. So I pointed him to different parts of scripture. And within days, he had already begun reading scripture. He was in Genesis, and then he started reading Luke, which was the two parts I pointed him to. Great. And, and we've continued having conversations. Sadly, he started a job somewhere else, which means that we can't connect with them as often. 
but uh, we're hoping that it'll start up again. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mick. Let's, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, as you can see there, these stories, that's the beauty of being family on mission. Different gifts are in play at the same time. In fact, as this was going on, I was having a kind of exercising a pastoral gift with somebody who was out in the uh, lounge who was um, going for a really difficult time at the moment. And uh, so this is a context, this is a culture in which we can all use our gifts as a team of missionary disciples to build up God's church. And it doesn't matter how confident you feel with a particular gift or not either. The size of uh, these communities is small enough uh, that it's not the intimidating crowd that we have on a Sunday, where if you kind of make a mistake, you're perhaps a bit embarrassed. Uh, but it's big enough that it's not kind of the overly intimate setting of a small group that makes uh, it perhaps embarrassing in another way if, you, if you're not quite confident. And so whether that's leading worship for the first time and forgetting a few chords or hosting for the first time and your living room's a bit of a mess or leading a bit of a Bible study for the first time for five minutes and you forget your references, this is the uh, size of this community is a safe space uh, where we can work things out together and as Paul says, become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the faithfulness of Christ. And so as we draw to a, a close, as we draw uh, this morning's teaching to a close and this series to a close, I'm going to uh, invite the band uh, back up on stage. They're going to uh, lead us in singing. Uh, but I also want to tell you about where we're going to go next. We've launched a page on our website uh, for you to find out more. And there's links on there to uh, stories, of, like I've shared this morning, of some real-life missional communities practicing being family on mission together. We also know that this series will have still left you with a lot of questions. And so we've produced uh, Missional Communities Frequently Asked Questions booklet, which are available at the back on the welcome store. And we'd love for each house in the church, someone in each house in the church, to go home with one of these at some point over the next few weeks and to take a look at that together. On March 13th, we have an open evening with cheese and uh, wine. You can book on, on the website or free church suite uh, to come and ask your questions and to hear more. And then as a, a church, we're going to be praying into this as we go uh, through the spring um, before we hope to launch some of these groups later in the year. So can I invite you to stand? Uh, we're going to pray together uh, and then we're going to end uh, by worshipping Jesus again. Father, thank you that you're always calling us into new things, that you never stop moving, that your great uh, mission uh, goes on, that you are raising up extended families on mission across uh, this land, uh, that you have not given up on this nation, um, but that you have uh, a gospel and we have a gospel uh, to tell. And so we pray that we would um, just listen to you now and in the coming uh, weeks for what part you have for us to play in it. And Holy Spirit, we invite you now, even as we sing, to come and stir our hearts afresh for your uh, great mission uh, that we might join in uh, together. Build our unity. Grow us in our confidence and in our faith. Come, Holy Spirit. As we worship together, um, there's going to be a team of people to pray with you. If you've been struck by anything I've said this morning or you're going through anything else in life that you want someone to pray with you for, do come forward and receive prayer. And if prayer ministry team could come forward during the song, that would be very much appreciated. Let's sing together.